Have you seen more churches becoming woke? For an extreme example, as I saw one church with a transgender Jesus. That's woke woke. <laughs> Why would the act of sacrifice, Jesus, which is he's basically sacrificing himself, he agrees to do this. Why does that save people? Okay, so then what made you settle on Christianity over anything else? I kind of got to the point where I realized that Christianity makes the most sense of all of reality. This episode is brought to you by NordVPN. A VPN like NordVPN is a good idea because the internet is super sketch at the moment. I suppose it's always been super sketch. NordVPN doesn't slow down my internet and then I don't have to think about or worry about what website I'm going to or where I'm ordering from, where I'm ordering what from, what I'm researching, etc. I think it's just a smart thing for people to have if they're online. You can go to nordvpn.com slash tmpp or use promo code tmpp for 61% off their premium plan plus their free anti-malware feature. Go to nordvpn.com slash tmpp or use that code for 61% off and you get their 30-day money-back guarantee. So protect yourself online. I use NordVPN. John McRae, welcome to my podcast. Yo, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, so this has been a long time coming. We spoke first, um, what was it? It was, okay, you would remember. We were on a podcast uh, together. Was it Justin Brierly? Uh, Justin Brierly, yeah. Brierly, okay. Yeah. And that's, yeah, yeah, and I've wanted to talk to you kind of since then, um, mostly because, so I'm, I'm fairly new uh, about, I guess, within Christianity and my beliefs, and so, I've been interviewing a couple of people, some one person, Jonathan Pajot, who he did, he was Christian Orthodox, which isn't, I think, the direction I'm going in, but um, that was very interesting. But I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. So I think before we get started, can you give a brief background about what did you do and who you are? Yeah, no, um, my name is John McCray and I run the YouTube channel called What Do You Mean? Um, there's not too much that's that interesting about me, I don't think, but, um, basically what? I just like to, yeah, I like to just like look at culture and look at Christianity and try to communicate the gospel to culture in a way that they can understand and try to kind of make it clear and concise, you know? So that's really kind of my focus. I mean, I, I've studied a lot of, you know, like apologetics and philosophy, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that a bit, little bit later, but yeah, so that's about it. So what made you decide to go down that path? I mean, becoming a becoming a large YouTuber by yeah. teaching people about Christianity isn't exactly the way to become a large YouTuber. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So um, it kind of happened accidentally. And I'm not sure how far back we want to go. But um, long story short, um, I lost my hearing randomly um, in like my mid 20s. So I randomly just kind of lost my hearing, went deaf. Um, in both years, I had 10 percent hearing left in this year and 15 percent hearing left in this year. And they, the doctors didn't know what happened, what caused it, what not. And so my hearing started going down. And I used to play music, so I figured it was from like playing music too loud and stuff. But then when I got to the doctor, they're like, no, it's um, it's too significant to be music. You know, they're like, it's something else. Like, And they don't know what caused it. There's a lot they still don't know about um, hearing loss. And so I had to get a cochlear implant. And um, are you familiar with cochlear implants at all? I know. Yeah, okay. if you can explain, though, for people who aren't familiar. Yeah, no problem. So the cochlear implant has an internal and an external component, and it's a hearing device. And what they do is there's um, underneath my skull, they surgically implanted a chip um, that's attached to these electrodes. Um, and they pump those into um, through your skull, through your ear canal. So that way it functions like the hair follicles. And so it's digital. And then there's an external component that attaches with a magnet. So once I turn on my processor and attach it, then it turns on. And um, what really sucks about it, though, is because after you get the surgery, you can't hear for a long time because your body has to relearn how to hear all over again. And it's a hard process. Um, so when I first got mine turned on, it sounded like, you know, those old school dial-up modems, you know, all those kind of weird ticks and beeps and stuff. Yeah, it wow. sounded like those. Yeah. And it was it was like that for over a year. Um, it was about a year and some when I started being able to hear again. And but I had to relearn it and it was a slow, long process. So it was during that time, though, that um, I started getting online and started just like debating atheists and stuff. And some of these um, 
these um, Facebook groups on Facebook. And so I was doing that for a while. And there was a guy that was um, always kind of watching me or, I mean, I was talking with me and, and watching me in these debates. And he's like, you should start a YouTube channel. And he was a guy that lived in Australia. And I was like, uh, I didn't really watch a lot of YouTube. And I was like, I don't really know what that would be. I never thought about it before. And he's like, look, I'm going to send you a camera and all this stuff you need to get started. Huh. He's like, just do it and give it a shot. And so I did. And then, yeah, and we ended up here a couple of years later. So. Wow. Was this another Christian? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a Christian guy in Australia. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. So have you been a Christian your entire life? Were you brought up in a Christian family? No, I wasn't. No. So we weren't like, we never went to church or anything. And we never even talked about God. And like my whole time kind of growing up, um, I was first introduced to the faith when I was 15. Um, and so I went to a church with my aunt. Um, but it was weird because I was introduced to this kind of Christianity that like now I just, you know, just don't agree with it at all. I just don't believe any of it. Um, but it was really kind of cultish, like, and it was really legalistic. And so like, it, it kind of left like a weird kind of bad taste in my mouth afterwards. And so after that, I was kind of just kind of more agnostic, like sometimes believing in God, sometimes not believing in God. And then eventually I um, um, sort of come, I took a philosophy of religion class in college. And in philosophy of religion, we went through the arguments for God's existence um, and that sort of thing. And then that's when I started becoming convinced that God existed. Um, one particular argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, I just was persuaded by. And then that's what kind of started me believing in God. And then I started visiting a bunch of different churches. And throughout visiting these different churches, I would start asking people questions about why they believe that their belief was true and why they believe other beliefs were false. And I keep getting all these kind of similar answers, no matter what type of church I went to. And I mean, I went to like the Church of Scientology. I went to like every kind of church you could oh, think wow. of. Yeah. And I kept in the same kind of answers, you know, like their life got better or, um, you know, there's a bunch of kind of. Um, things that happened in their life that was like showed them that this church was true. So it was a lot of stuff like that. And then eventually I came across the evidence for the resurrection online and started studying that and was convinced by the, the um, argument for the resurrection. Interesting. Okay. So you even went the Scientology route and you said you had similar yeah. answers kind of across the board about why they believed yeah. whatever they were believing was right. So what was, what did that yeah. answer look like? Yeah, so it was mostly just those um, ones where people say they, their life has changed since they started joining this church or following God. Um, or, and then they would say, like, there was all these kind of usually like some sort of set of like coincidences or something, things that would happen that they couldn't explain elsewise. And then okay. they would conclude, yeah, conclude that that was the reason why their church was true and they knew that God existed. Wow. And is this, this is for everyone, including like Scientology? This is just across the board. Yeah. Yeah, yeah across the board. Yeah, that's why it was so interesting to me, too, because it's like you, you when you start doing that, because you don't, I guess, like, I guess I at least I don't think like I wouldn't expect that, you know. And so when I started talking to all these people, it was really strange to me because I said, man, there's it's something that's kind of embedded in human psychology or, or I mean, who knows the explanation for it? Perhaps maybe um, God is using you know, I mean, God has given these people signs and stuff, but the problem with it is that, like, for my, in my mind, it was that all of these different religions couldn't be true because they mm -hmm. were all mutually exclusive, you know, and so that was, like, the big problem in my mind, and so that's why that was kind of, like, my first kind of introduction into, like, looking at religion and stuff way more in depth, and that's when I started getting online more and studying these different religions and stuff and what they believe and so on. Okay, so then what made you settle on Christianity over anything else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a long process, too, because um, it's a lot of thinking and stuff. Even when I started doing the debates and stuff, part of it was me trying to figure out what I believed and stuff and looking at the evidence and then testing it with, you know, uh, my arguments with people who disagreed and stuff like that. Um, but it was a long process. But really, I think it was like ultimately the historicity of the resurrection. Um, I became convinced. I mean, I think that I mean, all historians agree that Jesus was a real person who existed in history, you know, and when you follow these sort of. Um, objective kind of standards and methods that they use in order to come to um, uh, historical facts. I think that when you do that, you come across a lot of facts that I think is only explained by the fact that Jesus actually did raise from the dead. And so for me, that was like um, the thing where I spent a lot of time thinking about it too, like trying to run it around in my head, trying to like argue it with myself and with other people and so on. And I just slowly became more convinced of it. And I kind of got to the point where I realized that Christianity makes the most sense of all of reality. So it's not just like, you know, this external reality as well. Like say, 
the beginning of the universe, you know, when you look at that or when you look at like, why is there something rather than nothing like consciousness, you know, when you look at that, um, but also with your internal world as well. So with your internal world too, you're like, why are humans this way? Why do we have this impulse where we have this like near universal agreement that you shouldn't do things that are wrong, like steal, kill and rob and lie and all these things, but we still do those things, you know? And so like, it made sense to me of both the objective world and also my subjective world as well. Aren't there other religions that kind of abide by the same rules, like people, that people are bad, or at least killing, stealing, murder, all that is bad and that you shouldn't do it, but we still do it? Does not line up with a number yeah. of other religions? Yeah, but I don't understand the explanation for why that's the case in these other okay. religions, right? So, yeah, because I think in Christianity, if you have the view of like the sin nature and how we're all like, um, you know, subject to the to being slaves to the sin nature, then it makes a lot more sense, in my opinion. And then Christianity is the only religion that actually solves this problem as well. You know what I mean? And so, so it's like you have this problem of like this perfectly holy God. And then you have, and then so it's like, how could we live in the presence of a perfectly holy God, um, a perfectly moral God? How can we live in his presence unless we two are perfect? You know, and so I think that Christianity actually takes the idea of sin a lot more seriously because it's like God is so holy and he's so morally perfect and righteous that in order to be in his presence, we would also need to be holy and righteous. And so it's like, how do we solve that problem? Like, what is the problem and what is the solution? And that's what it really boils down to in my mind. And it's like Christianity solves it because um, only in Christianity do you have God, who is also perfect, of course, God is perfect, coming into our world, putting on human flesh and coming into our world and living that perfect life that we couldn't live. So that way, when uh, and then giving us that life as a, you know, as a sacrifice for us. And so when he's given us his life, I mean, given us his life um, in our place, then we can actually stand before God with his imputed righteousness is what it's called, the doctrine of imputed righteousness. But we have that righteousness now, so that way we can be in heaven. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. This is So this is where I've had a difficult time understanding. Why would the act of sacrifice, like so Jesus, is, which is which is he's basically sacrificing himself. He agrees to do this. Yeah. Why does that save people? Yeah. Um, and so maybe I probably didn't articulate this well, but really it's because we have to have, so when you look at the Bible as a whole, even starting at the Old Testament, what you have is like humans are separated from God. They're separating themselves from God because they're trying to go their own way. And so mm -hmm. like our sin nature believes that we can get all of our happiness. We like, we don't need God. We can get all of these things apart from God. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we, we separate ourselves from God through sin. Um, but if you look at the Old Testament too, there was always a sacrifice um, of a perfect um, animal it was like they got these unblemished animal, animals and stuff in the Old Testament, and then they would be used as a mediator between God because of the pureness of the animal, and it was really kind of symbolic too at that time as well. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Kinda. So. Okay. You, okay. I, I get that as a mediation between. Okay. I can kind of understand yeah. that. I've just had a hard time. Like, uh, these things resonate with me on a, a level that I can't exactly describe, but I've had a hard right. time understanding why is it sacrifice? Why is that yeah. that's what saves you? Yeah. yeah it's, it really is because it's complicated. Of, <laughs> it is. No, it is. I think it's because you, you would need, like, kind of like going back to that example, what I said about, like, being in uh, a perfect God's presence you need perfection of that sort, right? And so if you aren't perfect, the way you become rightly related to God is through the, the um, a sacrifice of someone that is perfect. And so like Jesus is the fulfillment of, of um, you know, the New Testament. So Jesus becomes that unblemished lamb, that perfect sacrifice for us uh, because his life is perfect. And so it's his imputed righteousness that we get from believing. And so if we believe, we get that imputed righteousness on our behalf. So that way God sees, because of God's perfect mercy and justice as well too right um um yeah i'm jumping over topics i'm sorry but uh, on no, his no, perfect, no. Um, okay good so his perfect um so god is perfect in justice right and so if a judge is perfectly just he has to punish every single wrongdoing right and it's also the thing that's separating us between god right um but god is also perfectly merciful and so because he's perfectly merciful he made a way for us to be rightly related to him and that was through the sacrifice of jesus that makes sense. Yeah. So, so Jesus took on the punishment in that aspect. 
cool. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad we delved into that a little bit. I think that's what stuck. Yeah. Like w when I first, so last summer, I had the same kind of experience that you said you saw everywhere, which was yeah. a whole bunch of really strange things happened. They like, they lined up. And then when I started believing my life changed. So it was like yeah. too yeah. many weird things that I couldn't explain happened until God was the most logical explanation. And then once I started believing my life changed for the better. So that sounds like yeah. what people experience, regardless of whatever religion they're looking at. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I did, la I did land on uh, Christianity, and one of the things that kind of had me like stuck a little bit. And I started going to this church. I found I finally found a church. I wanted to talk to you about this too, about the importance of finding a church because um, my husband. So he's been Christian for his entire life, and in the last year we were in Tennessee and things, and he kept pushing me to go to church. And I'd go to church, and I'd be like. I wasn't, it wasn't resonating. The pastor I felt was posturing. Like it felt like I was listening to a cult. Like it's just, I, I had a whole bunch of warning things yeah. go off in my head. And I'm like, I'm not that interested in, yeah. not to like talk negatively about churches, but I wasn't that interested in going to like a gymnasium and listening to somebody posture under fluorescent lights for my Sunday. I was like, it's not, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I can't even fake me liking this for you. It's like, right. I can't do it. All pretty right. disagreeable <laughs> and, we, and we looked around and then we found this pastor in like uh just north of miami and he's complete like he's good he's great so yeah. we're going there and that's amazing and i don't get any like weird culty vibes um yeah what's been, <laughs> what's been your ex experience with churches man yeah, i i so interesting because because i didn't grow up in a church going home or anything like that church yeah has always been weird to me in some ways yeah you me know? too it's like yeah it's the strangest thing because it's like man like the facade it feels like that a lot of people put on it's like you know you have like all the ned flanders <laughs> type christians you yeah. know? and stuff like that it's awkward you know what i mean and so it's like that those churches kind of turn me off and so we found a church too that was um, where people seem to be normal. Like I just want to meet normal people and have normal conversations. You know what I mean? And so, um, and then learn like a normal person. You know? And so, like I think, like um, I think, especially for us, like as millennials, I think like we want like just authenticity, like people that are just authentic and authentic community. You know? But it, I agree. I mean, it's it's been tough for me too, like just to kind of not only just feel like I belong. You know what I mean? But also be able to feel like um um gonna learn something too and i'm not just hearing like yeah. completely like anecdotal like you know just stories or something that's like mostly story like i like to learn when i go to church too which i don't know how most people are but anyways yeah so i i always had a kind of an uncomfortable relationship with church as well so okay that's good i think one of the reasons i talked to my dad about it too because he talks about like he talks about the importance of community and everything and my mom yeah. um she's catholic at the moment she's been going to church and um I was like, I can't do it. And he he was like, yeah, the reason we never went to church, like we, we weren't, he, we were always taught the psychological significance of the Bible, not the Bible being real. Like that's what, that's what uh -huh. I was taught. Um, but he was like, part of the reason we didn't go to church was because they're just like, it was fake. It felt fake. It felt like people yeah. posturing. It felt fake. And uh -huh. I couldn't stand it. And I was yeah. like, okay. That makes yeah, sense. That, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, like, it's, yeah. I, I think I would have probably, like, if I'd gone to or been introduced to a community of people, maybe I was pretty skeptical, so maybe it wouldn't have worked. But as yeah. a kid, instead of kind of the the churches that just feel a little, <laughs> yeah, like Ned, Flansery, Fl Fl Ned Flanders-ish, ish, yeah. but like, okay, yeah. okay. So that's normal. That's good. Yeah. And maybe yeah, from not being in yeah. it, yeah, from not being in it, maybe less tolerance for that just get yeah okay agree cool. i agree yeah i was gonna ask too like what was it like I, i've been, I was kind of been curious like so if your dad kind of has more of that psychological perspective I, have you seen my video my videos on your dad any of them i know i saw one pop up on youtube i haven't watched it though okay okay no worries okay because i kind of analyzed kind of his perspective but do you think like your perspective differs from his in that sense um because you have more of like an objective kind of view of christianity right like this yeah. actually happened is that right that's what i thought and what, what do you think causes that cause that difference just kind of curious um so i think dad goes back and forth i think the yeah. longer 
he's talking about it, the more he's moving towards the objective view. Okay. Um, I think understanding as much about psychology as he does, there yeah. are, I mean, there is psychological significance to the Bible and yeah. I believe it's objective, right? Yeah. So okay. like there's yeah. psychological significance, to, like every aspect of the Bible in multiple ways, yeah. plus, plus it's objective. And so yeah. I think he probably got wrapped up in in the psycho psychological significance. And and honestly, if you're if you have more of a scientific background, um we were told for a very long time that like science, if you believed in science, then you couldn't believe in the Bible, which right, I think is ridiculous. Yeah. Like I don't think that yeah. that was necessary at all. Like those two things yeah. didn't have to be polar opposites. Um yeah. so I th I think he got wrapped up in that, but I also think that he's writing he's writing a book at the moment called We Who Wrestle with God. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, really this cool. is going to be intense. Um, and he thinks he can yeah. disprove atheism. So oh, <laughs> I would I would say yeah. he's whatever direction that that's in, he's yeah. going in. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that I, book. He, well, because it seems like he has a. Uh, I think he's done a talk on it. I've watched it though, but on the problem of perception, which is a kind of like a philosophical problem of how do you get from the subjective to the objective. And so when I've heard a lot of his stuff, it seems like that's where kind of the barrier is. It's like, okay, we have the psychological world, the narrative world, I think he calls it a lot of times too. But then how do you go from that to like what's objective, what's external of your consciousness and your conscious perception? And so I think um, that's what seems like that holds him back where that's not probably not necessarily a barrier for you in that sense. I think it wasn't a barrier for me um, because so many strange things have happened to me like e even as a kid yeah. i was so i was so sick i was suffering so much yeah. i can remember like when i was when i had my hip and ankle replaced and I, I was in like i was in so much pain it was unbelievable for an entire year like broken bones but like not able yeah. to be fixed and yeah. i remember thinking at that point that like something had to be real like i didn't know if god was real but that amount of pain and suffering like something evil had to be real um and and then things were just have been super weird with my life like being that ill like unbelievably stupidly like job level ill i remember right, reading job yeah. and being like i've got a lot of those things going on like my family hasn't <laughs> died but like a lot of those <laughs> things are going on and then having like fixing it with a diet that like nobody believed right and like what is that about mm -hmm. and then yeah having my mom yeah. get really sick and then my dad get really sick and then my dad get famous for like it's just things have been so absurd that it's like yeah well that yeah. stuff could have happened <laughs> it seems logical yeah, yeah. Life's, life's pretty weird yeah yeah that is because you you have had a different life like you know i was thinking even like i was thinking what it'd be like for you to to like you're living your life and then all of a sudden your dad like explodes in a social consciousness like out of nowhere see that would throw everything off as well too and yeah. then it's like all the stuff you went through as a kid and the autoimmune um, aspects that you had too, and then trying to new diet that nobody else is, um, you know, people think you're probably like, they're like, what is that? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. So that would be, so it makes sense to me why, like you kind of like, you start, start processing things a different way. Yeah. The other thing I do think contributed to this and I've had some like negative feedback about this, but I did do, and this was, well, mostly because I was interested in them, but I did do psychedelics quite a bit. I haven't done right, them in a yeah. while, but I did do them quite a bit. And I think that really, and I'm not saying that's the way to do it. Because people oh, are yeah, like, well, yeah. that's not how you have to do it. I'm like, yeah. yes, I agree. But I think for me, <laughs> yeah. for me, it, it like put me in a state where I was seeing things that aren't there. And uh, mm -hmm. and that, I don't, for whatever reason, it was like, well, those experiences probably led me to believe God was a possibility because you can't see him exactly right, right. you can yeah. kind of yeah. see things that happen kind of but like you have to believe there isn't like that's i think one of the things i didn't understand until more recently was there isn't like at least this is and i still believe this there isn't some definitive proof that everyone is going to believe that like oh well here's the proof of god right. um yeah. Although I think dad maybe in his new book is <laughs> trying to yeah. do something like that. But regardless, yeah. like there's, you have to suspend judgment a little bit, right? You have to believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do think psychedelics helped me do that because they showed me things I couldn't see. 
What do yeah. you think about that? Yeah, and, what's your, what's your opinion no, on those? No. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. So, um, my, my thinking about it is like, it's almost like everything else. I think all of us need to get out of our own way in some way. Um, but it's like, for example, if people go to prison, right? Like, and then they find God in prison, which happens to a lot of people yeah. being poor, being homeless. So these sorts of things, like God can use these um, different kind of situations in order to point us to our se- um, point us to himself. And so I think like, um, it's not a prescriptive thing. I don't, I wouldn't say like people need to go try psychedelics to find God. Right. Because I think that's just the means in which God used um through because yeah. god uses us through the things like that we do and the things we do wrong and like all of these different ways like everything that we do god can still use any of these things in order to draw us to himself so i think in that time um you know god just used that that moment i guess in that aspect um or at least you were open to it i guess from that you know and then god was knocking on the door i mean so in some ways so my, my thinking on it is like i mean i think that like the bible tells us to be sober-minded so um you know, so whatever that entails, but I don't, I wouldn't say that you should do psychedelics, you know, in that aspect. But, um, I think that in this aspect, it's like, it was, um, God used it for good. You know, he turns all things around for good for those that love him. So this episode is brought to you by better fed beef. The holidays are here. Let's be honest. Pretty much everyone prefers beef to ham or turkey. So why not treat yourself to some of the tastiest and most tender beef out there by going to betterfedbeef.com and using code MP for a whopping 25% off. I don't know how they give you guys that and also make money. This is the beef I eat every day and I can eat any beef I want, which is a pretty sweet deal. These are the guys I choose to eat. So that's saying something. They're super tender and importantly, I do care about this stuff. They care for their animals. It's a family run business and the meat is super good. They have a killer deal too, 25% off with code MP. If you've never tried Anya beef, then you should taste the difference. This stuff is good. It's very tender, comes from amazing family farms that treat their cows right. Just go to betterfedbeef.com and use code MP for 25% off your order. It's a good deal. Check them out. It's what I eat. I like him. Okay. That's kind of the conclusion I've come to. Like th- there okay. were there were yeah. a couple of things. It was like that that was like a little push and then some really bad, like really dark, desperate moments, you know. Um yeah. at the like rock bottom is probably yeah. when I converted. Yeah. Yeah. Like I because I remember hearing your story. I don't I don't think so. It's crazy because I said so when I talked earlier about like everybody having these kind of coincidences and stuff like that, I would still put that in that same category. I'd say like I don't know the cause. Like so the cause could be God, right? And I'd say that it could be other things, but regardless, God still used that situation to draw him to himself. And so in that aspect, I mean, I, I that's like I'm not against experiences or anything like that, you know. I guess um for me, I just think that we need to try to tether them and balance them out with objective reality, you know, so that way we know like what's true because you figure say you have an experience about uh muhammad or something like this right you convert to islam and you become a terrorist right (laughs) so like that wouldn't be good you know what i mean and so it's like you want to try to like what is actually true you know what i mean and if it's like whatever's actually true we want to have our beliefs correspond with reality and you know try not to go up the deep end yeah i like that i like that i've probably had so many strange things happen to me too that I like, I don't believe, you know, a, a bunch of the things I believed in kind of crumbled over the last, probably since 2016, like media, yeah. you know, any anything I read in the media, I don't know if anything online I read is true. And then yeah. anything yeah. the government yeah. says, I have no idea if anything they say is true. Yeah. True, And I don't know how yeah. deep that goes. And then it's like yeah. even censoring on social media platforms. It's like, oh, that sounds like paranoia. And then Elon Musk buys Twitter and is like, nah, you weren't being paranoid Mm. enough. And it's just like, (laughs) I think I've probably, I've probably uh, switched over to trying to understand things intuitively, which is something I would have just like murdered myself over if I'd heard myself say that as like a 17 year old. It's like, oh, you're going on intuition. Okay there. But I think I've probably switched over to like, no, I know on some level that feels right. And that's probably been strengthened since converting. I think that's gotten right, yeah. easier. Like I never understood before if I did things, you know, you know, if you lie and p- anybody, mm-hmm. including people who aren't like religious, know that if you lie, you feel bad and it can just feel mm-hmm. like soul crushingly shivering, like deep evil bad yeah. when you lie. Yeah. Why mm-hmm. would it feel like that? 
Like, why would it yeah. feel that evil when you lie? I mean, for a normal yeah. person, it should feel like that. And I think it, it, yeah. it does line up with sin and, and Christianity making you feel yeah. that way. Yeah, I think because um, the way I kind of look at it is like you have these natural laws, like, say, the law of gravity, you know, or, um, so you have these natural laws like thermodynamics and these things that govern the physical universe. But it seems like there's a natural law of love that governs us inside of the universe, you know, our kind of moral selves, um, because when we get out of alignment with that, like um, we can't allow ourselves because we have free will, I believe. So we can't allow ourselves to get more hard, um, hard and stuff towards stuff. And that's why C.S. Lewis talked about, like, um, when you continue to do stuff, you either become a better person or a worse person from all your little decisions, because when you do something bad, it's easy to do something bad the next time. And same with being good, you know, but um, I the ask the, the aspect of like everybody having um, this kind of moral um, awareness of some sort, even though they're going to differ on stuff, you know, depending on background information, but there's a moral awareness of some sort that I think is interesting because I think it makes more sense on theism um, that God created us with these, um, with this, with this morality on our hearts, as the Bible says, that makes more sense to me than some sort of evolutionary explanation. Yeah, it's hard to chalk up. I've been one of the disagreements I had, although my husband, I think, yeah. is converting over. It was like, um, when, whenever I heard right. about Christians, especially like as a kid, I was like, oh, Christians, the people mm -hmm. who don't believe in evolution, like that's that's right. what yeah. I knew about Christians, the people who don't believe in in evolution, yeah. and. And so I've talked, so I, what's, what's your opinion on this? Okay. Um, yeah. And then I'll tell you my opinion. You go first. What's okay. your opinion on evolution? Okay. Okay. So, so here's my thinking. So it's, it's, and this is a complex thing and I'm not too far into it because I don't see it as really a stumbling block for a lot of people today. Um, a lot of the younger generations, they don't really care if evolution is true or not in order to believe in God. So that's why I don't spend a ton of time focusing on it. But my thinking goes something like this. When I look at the Bible, you know, you have 66 books, you know, written over a span of 1500 years, you know, three different continents, that aspect. But all of the different books, you have to understand what the genre is, right? So when I look at like Psalms, I understand that's not a historical genre, you know what I mean? And when I look at the Gospels, I understand that it is um, ancient Roman bio, you know what I mean? So I can understand it through that lens. And so you want to understand each book of the Bible through its appropriate lens. Um, so it's like the Proverbs are not like, okay, these are promises. The Proverbs on promises is wisdom, it's Proverbs, you know what I mean? And so um, understanding that now in most places in the Bible is pretty clear and pretty straightforward. But there's some places in the Bible where we're not exactly sure wh what it is for, for different reasons. And so when it comes to the book of Genesis, at least Genesis 1 to 12, um, it seems that there's something more going on than it just being this like historical narrative. It seems to be blending in um, just sort of like um, the stories of the culture at that time in the ancient Near East, um, blending in these stories to, for a theological purpose. That That's the way I understand it, at least, is because it seems like from a theological purpose rather than just a, a strict historical purpose. That doesn't seem to, to make a lot of sense to me logically when I'm looking at it and then looking at the different accounts and that sort of thing. And then also reading all of the, the literature in the ancient Near East as well, too, that's available. Um, but I think, um, so when it comes to that, and so I, I think about the that lens, and then I look at the world, you know what I mean, and try to see what makes more sense. Um, I can't see um, the world making sense to me for it to be 6,000 years old. That, that doesn't logically make sense to me, and it, it doesn't seem like it corresponds with reality. Um, you can have ways around it, but well, we can talk about those later if needed. But um, but then I think you have bigger problems. So if you said God created it and with the appearance of age, then I think you have bigger problems because then how can you know anything at all, really? You know what I mean? Because you're, the whole epistemic system is broken. And so that's a problem for me. But um, I, I'd say that what I found to be the most persuasive, and again, I've only read a few books on this, but what I found to take as the most persuasive evidence for evolution would be like the pseudogenes. Um, so, for example, whales have like um, these OR genes, they're oscillatory receptors. And so it's they're used for detecting violet chemicals outside of water, but these genes are dormant. And so you figure if God created the well just as is, then why would he create it with these genes? You know, what I mean? because they're, they're not being used. So I think that's probably some of the bigger evidence, but I still think that there's so many gaps in the fossil record. So, um, yeah, so it's really tough. I haven't come to any like strong conclusions on it, but I think that there's something like um, some sort of, well, everybody believes in evolution to some degree, like there's some sort of evolving process, but I don't tend to hold to the view. I don't think that you have these different um, 
uh, these different um, kinds of animals. I hate using that term, but so these different kinds of animals turning into other kinds of um, animals. So like the distinction I make of like macro evolution, um, it doesn't seem, that doesn't seem as plausible to me, but there is some sort of thing going on where you have these creatures that are like, um, that have clearly shown some sort of evolution um, from, you know, being land animals, water animals, so on, you know, so there's, there's clearly some sort of evolution going on. I just don't think that it's that one blanket term of like everything comes from a single common, um, you know, single common, um, can't remember the term they use for it, but just like one, one, like ancestor. a neighbor or something like that. Yeah. 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 There you go. Common okay. So what I've thought about, and I've had this discussion with my husband because I don't think yeah. he'd really thought about it before. It was like, who cares? Okay. But, um, right, I joke, yeah. uh, like I have a, I took biomedical science, a bunch of courses of biomedical mm-hmm. science. So I like got taught evolution. So, and I, I remember like learning about Darwin and things. So I, I've known this for a long time. I I think that we've done quite a bit of research going back towards like the Big Bang that scientifically yeah. I can't, I believe what the scientific community is saying. I think that lines up with the Bible. Um, I just don't think the day yeah. period is right. So when it's like, yeah. oh, God created the world in seven days it was like i i don't necessarily think that one of those days for god is the same as one of these 24-hour days for us yeah. that's yeah. like the most logical explanation to try yeah. and line up both of those things because otherwise i can see why people say that they don't line up but i think yeah yeah one of the things that like dissuaded me from christianity or made me look at christians like they didn't know what they were talking about was like i put them in the same categories like flat earthers I just as yeah. a kid, for whatever yeah. reason, and I don't know if that's because I was in like, I just wasn't around Christian people at all, but I just put them yeah. in like, or I was watching too much Simpsons. Like, I'm not sure what it was, yeah. but yeah, yeah, you know that. I mean, I I I think so too because I mean, um, and it's always tough because it's like I respect people who really take the Bible seriously, you know what I mean? And we should take the Bible seriously too. But um, sometimes it's like they don't take it seriously enough where they kind of do the interpretive analysis with a lot of stuff. Because like you even said too, with um, the day, the um, you know, the day theory too with like yom is the word for day. And then you have these different, um, you have the word appearing, you know, later on in the Old Testament too, referring to different periods of time. Then also, you know, the scripture. Um, a Wait, day is say like that again. So, you, yeah, so you, you, a, you, yeah, say that again. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. So, um, yeah, so the word for day in the Old Testament is yom, um, I believe. Yeah. My memory serves me great. It's been a while since I've looked at this stuff. Um, but um, I know you have later on in the Old Testament, too, you have this word used, and it's not referring to just a single linear day. Um, oh, that's also aspect interesting. Of, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, and so because of that, yeah, then so it does allow for different interpretations um, of the, um, that passage. But I think, too, it com- comes down to that genre. And because we're not super aware of what that genre is, I think that we should be open minded to say how it should be interpreted. This. But the way I look at it is that everything is theological at its core. So what is the theological point that we get from it? And then how does that apply to the rest of the Bible, the story of the Bible, and also to our personal lives as well? Cool. OK, that's cool. Um, what what denomination do you practice? Just a non. Can you practice a denomination? Is that what it's called? Yeah, 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 yeah. I <laughs> <Okay>. guess denomination. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because my wife is from Tennessee, and out there, there's like all this beef between like the Baptist and the Church of Christ and stuff, you know, because everybody identifies as Christian out there. But like out in Colorado, here, like. I'm just happy to see people who are Christians and taking us seriously, you know, because so we don't we don't really do too many denominations out here. There's no denomination beef that I'm aware of, at least. But yeah. Oh, that's funny. OK, probably same kind of thing. Well, d- Toronto's pretty uh, atheist or even maybe agnostic, but mostly atheist. Um, I think there's a lot okay. of Catholicism and orthodoxy. Okay. And then yeah. Christian like other non-denominational, I guess. That makes sense. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Are you, um, have you been looking at the denominations at all or is it kind of like not really? Okay. Didn't, didn't think so. No, not really. Um, whatever like Protestant is, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I honestly, I probably don't know enough about it to like come to a conclusive decision, but yeah. I feel like the, it, there's just like little differing rules, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah, it's like different preferences, basically. So uh, a lot of them. I mean, so some people like the, um, 
Yeah, like different styles and different kind of cultures. And it's one of the things that makes Christianity kind of beautiful as well. I think in that aspect, too, is like you have these different ways of expressing um, your worship and, and these sorts of things, too, you know. But the denomination fact makes sense to me why we have so much plurality and denominations. And I think it really the Bible kind of explains we all have this tendency to like want to elevate ourselves and elevate things that we think are important and pride in this sort of thing. And so I think that that's the other um, aspect of it. There's a good side to it and a bad side. But the bad side is we like to divide. Like we like to divide on things that might not be as critical as we like to think they are, you know, because they're important to us. We seem they're important to God. You know, in, in, in that aspect, so we're like, well, this is super important because I feel strongly about this. And you'll see that with all the different kind of theological accounts. Um, but I think at least on the Bible, it makes sense, you know, because I don't see how it makes sense on other religions back to what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. No, fair enough. Ooh, OK, this is a good one. Um, do you th have you seen more churches becoming woke? Do you think this is creeping into churches? Yeah, so. I, I guess the question is, what do you mean by woke, right? So um, do you mean woke is in woke in like some sort of like um, just liberal eyes sense or? Uh, I mean, mean, say, well, I mean, for an extreme example, as I saw one church with a transgender Jesus, I, right, I mean, yeah, like, I yeah. mean, I mean, that kind of woke. I mean, yeah, kind of, yeah that, that's woke woke. <laughs> That's well quote. Yeah, I, I guess changing, uh, you know, not teaching parts of the Bible because it doesn't line up with more progressive attitudes. Have you seen this happening yeah. or is this like right wing propaganda that isn't real? That's a great question. I, I, I don't think it's as popular. And I could be wrong on this, actually, too, because um, I'd like to see a statistical analysis of it. But I don't think it's as popular because when even when I look at these type channels, these YouTube channels that are like these super progressive, um, progressive Christian channels uh, where they have like, you know, these these type of trans pastors or whatever, um, they don't tend to have a lot of followers either. So I don't think it's that attractive to a lot of people, um, a lot of these channels. So I see it more as like um, um maybe like right wing taking advantage of a situation, you know what I mean, to show how bad the kind of liberal agenda is and that sort of thing. Uh, but I could be wrong on that too. I'm, I'm open to being corrected. Um, but what I kind of see, like this makes me think that what, what I kind of see as a problem with um, uh, with politics for Christians is that when you look at the Bible, you have all of these different things that don't fit nice and neatly into um, one category. Um, and I think it was Tim Keller that talked about like um, for Christians that say there's like, um, there's um, four things like the Bible shows us that um, Christians should be sold out and against racial injustice. Um, Christians should be deeply concerned about the poor and the marginalized. Um, Christians should be pro-choice or pro-life. I mean, I'm sorry, pro-life, <laughs> pro-life. And um, they should also um, um, and they also um, hold to belief in a, um, a marriage is only between a man and a woman um, for a lifetime. And so because of that, um, you have two of them sound conservative. Two of them sound liberal, you know what I mean? But the early church was defined by all four, you know what I mean? The early church was very clear about all four of these things. And so because of that, it, it kind of makes it bad because if you go to a church and say, L.A., um, you know, a pastor is going to be vocal about two of them, you know, and then kind of hush about the other two. And then it's the same thing if you go to church in Louisiana, right? You're going to have a uh, the church is going to be vocal about two and not vocal about the other two. But I think as Christians, we have to be um, our worldview needs to be more integrated in terms of like. Um, a biblically grounded worldview rather than it just being just solely one political side. I think we need to be open to saying like, what is, what does the Bible say about these issues uh, rather than what do the conservative commentators say about these issues? And then trying to make that fit into the Bible and thinking that everything liberals say is wrong, you know what I mean? Or vice versa, everything conservatives say is wrong. So I think we need more of a holistic approach. It's more biblically grounded than it just being um, looking at one I mean, one political group and thinking that they represent God and the other one doesn't per se, you know, so. Um, so that's my view on politics, where I think that it's could be somewhat of an issue for a lot of Christians, because there's a lot of pressure to conform all of your views over to just one side of the count rather than having more nuanced views that are in accordance with Scripture. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, do you yeah. do you think actually you'd know the statistics better than me is um, is Christianity still shrinking 
or is it making a comeback more recently? Or do I just think it's making a comeback because I converted? <laughs> yeah. It's definitely making you, a comeback. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's another great question. Um, I, I think from last I've looked at it, it's still shrinking. Um, but okay. the, what's interesting about it is it's almost, it's, all, it's like that same question of what do you mean by Christianity? Because um, a lot of people who identify as nuns, they say the nuns say that they don't want to be identified as a particular religion. But um, they're still just as likely to hold belief in God and belief in the Bible and pr their prayer life and this sort of thing, too. They just don't like the connotations or whatever that Christianity is identified with. So this is what makes it kind of hard, because when we're asking a lot of these questions on these surveys, we're not asking some of the, the right questions. We're asking some of the questions that, like, um, people are going to have to answer in a binary way, but it's more nuanced than that. And so I think that's where the issue is, because I think that we probably... Um, I think there's probably still a high degree of people um, that believe in something like Christianity. But I mean, biblical uh, literacy is so far low right now that like it's hard to say, like, what do these people mean to when they say they identify as Christians? You know, like, have more of a view of culture, some sort of relative view of Christianity where everything is relative. And I'll take some parts of Christianity, some part of some parts of Buddhism or whatever, you know, whatever works for my life. And so that's why I think a lot of the statistics make it hard to kind of tell what's really going on. That makes sense. Um, do you get people like, I suppose your audience is mainly Christian. Do you get atheists watching you just out of curiosity? Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm not sure the percentage, but yeah, I get um, comments from atheists that say they, they like my channel or whatnot, you know? So, um, but yeah, no idea the percentage. I'm sure it's, a, it's definitely a majority of Christian for sure. You know, at least probably 90% at least I'd assume, but yeah. What made you want to debate people about this? It sounds like my worst nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great question, too. Uh, for me, like, um, I like to hear different sides to everything that I'm considering. So that way I can think it through well on my own. Um, because I think, like, if I'm missing um, the other sides of the argument, then how am I supposed to weigh that? And then how am I supposed to communicate to people yeah. to try to convince them of the other side? And so it's really important to me because... That's why I do, did a lot of my fleshing out for like a lot of the early stuff that I came to believe. A lot of the fleshing out was me actually just debating it and then trying to take into consideration what the other side was saying as charitably as possible, you know, so that way I can understand what I even believe. So for me, it was like a lot of processing. Um, like today, I mean, I'm not that interested in debating people as much, you know, but I mean, I don't really mind debates. Like it doesn't, they don't really worry me, but I'm not really that interested because I think that the purpose they serve is it's it's kind of limited in a lot of ways because people are just more polarized on stuff you know so like conversations are a lot better than just like you know trying to prove your side you know because then people will just shut down and won't take in any new information for the most part who are your favorite uh i don't know what the right word for this is i'd say like thought leaders in the kind of yeah. online yeah. for christians who do you follow yeah so um so I'd say like if, if we're going to say like my kind of main kind of influences that's had the biggest impact on how I think. Um, there we go. Outside of. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> outside of um, like Paul the Apostle is where like a lot of like my arguments and stuff I really formulate from Paul, which is which is interesting. But outside of like the Bible, um, I'd say um, William Lane Craig played a really big role in shaping how I think, um, because this is where I kind of learned how to. Um, think more deductively and think more philosophically and concise and make these distinctions and define words, um, you know, so that way you can understand what you're saying at its foundation and then stack up. So um, he was a really big influence. Um, Tim Keller was a really big influence um, because of his gospel centric focus, which is uh, similar to what um, I took influence for with my channel is having more of a gospel um, center focus to show people the relevancy of the gospel in their lives um, and for non-believers too to see how the gospel can make sense and integrate into their lives. Um, and then um, my best friend is other one. You know, his name is Joey Fukumoto. But uh, me and him, um, we've we've debated about everything, like <laughs> everything. So it's like he, he's helped me think better because what we do is before we even like bring up some sort of like argument or something, we always know that we have to like define our terms. You know, it's like, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? Those are two questions. And 
the book tactics. Um, but like we're, we're constantly doing this with each other and we like argue about everything and it's really good and healthy because he'll push me on stuff. I'll push him on stuff and we both just keep getting sharper because of it, you know, so we have to think things through better because he doesn't let me get away with anything and I don't let him get away with any kind of lazy thinking either. So I think that, um, and he's brilliant by the way, he's way smarter than me. And so because of that, I think it's really kind of helped as well, kind of like, you know, test out stuff with him and then try to argue with him about stuff and then figure stuff out together. So. So those are probably my top three influences, I'd say. That's cool. Okay, that's fun. Um, yeah. So you you brought up before. So you said you you had health problems too. You had this you have this hearing thing, which is major. Yeah. Um, how how did that and and that's when you started kind of debating people online. Um, mm -hmm. You said you were first exposed to Christianity when you were fifteen, but in kind of a culty way. <laughs> yeah, for lack yeah. of better words. Um, what yeah. made you switch into taking it more seriously? Was it before you got yeah. sick? Um, no, um, that's what's kind of interesting about it. So um, really, it was like kind of during that um, hearing loss time when I was doing these debates, that's when I started kind of thinking way more about it than I ever thought before, too. Like I thought a lot about it in, in college, taking philosophy of religion course and stuff and after it. But kind of like it kind of reinvigorated that in me um, during that time. And then when it comes to like um, the gospel, that's a that's a longer story. But that's when things really kind of changed for my life, I think, is everything changed. Once I continued to start learning the gospel more, really working at understanding these different perspectives and stuff, and then internalizing that gospel message is when everything really changed. Um, so I guess I can kind of run through it briefly, but um so I guess when I first converted to Christianity, I wasn't really like that clear on the relationship between works and salvation, um, because I think everybody has like these kind of muddled views or but I think a Protestant problem, I'd say more so is they have more of a muddled view with like where do works fit in with salvation, this sort of thing. Um, and so I had a view that's somewhat kind of like I'd say most people probably have this where it's like, well, if you're a Christian, you know, you're going to be producing tons of good works. And then by looking up these good works, you can tell somebody's a Christian or not. Um, but um, I remember there was a guy that came in to a reasonable faith meeting that I was teaching for locally, um, teaching on like apologetics and stuff. And um, he was asking these tough questions. He says, like, can a Christian live like Hitler and still be saved? You know what I mean? Which is questions that's super uncomfortable for people. You know what I mean? It's like, um, super uncomfortable because you want to say, yeah, but then you're like, oh, that sounds so bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you say, so you don't really, then you were like, no, that's too counterintuitive, you know? Um, but really like during this time, I spent a few, I think I spent about two and a half years at least, I think, uh, me and, um, my friend too, my best friend, um, and also talking with a whole lot of other people really working through all of these scriptures and stuff. What are these scriptures that seem to say works and what do they say about salvation? And so we went through all these scriptures. We started talking and thinking through this stuff and, um, you know, looking at all these different views and commentaries. And I became convinced that I think works, um, were saved completely by grace. Grace is a free gift. We're saved okay. completely by grace through faith. Yeah. Completely by grace through faith. I don't think, I think that the Bible is pretty clear about this and, um, I mean, so many passages, Romans 11, 6 makes a distinction where Paul says, basically, if it's by grace, it can't be through faith uh, because if I mean, I'm sorry, if it's by grace, it can't be through works because if it yeah. was by works, it would no longer be grace. A clear distinction. I give you a gift, you know, um, then it's like you have Christian living, um, how you want how you're supposed to live, how you're supposed to love others, treat God, treat others and stuff after um, that salvation. That's how you're supposed to live your life now, um, to be in court in accordance with, you know what I mean? This, this new life that God has given you. Um, but I think that like a lot of times Christians, we all have a tendency to like, want to like look down and say, these other people aren't saved because we're, we don't like the way they're living. You know what I mean? People can look at my tattoos and say, I'm not saved. You know what I mean? And so that whatever's important to people, we tend to be really judgmental towards those things because, I think that's part of our sin nature, you know, and to be completely fair, it's completely counterintuitive to think that Christians can do bad stuff, um, like really bad stuff. It's really counterintuitive, but reality yeah. and the Bible shows us that that's the case, you know, and um, so really there's like a lot of passages like James 2, where faith of our works is dead, and the Matthew 7 passage where Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. There's all these different kind of um, scriptures people kind of run to um, to say that a Christian um, by necessity has to be producing good works, but um, I don't think that that's necessarily the case because I think everybody produces good works. And then it's a slippery slope because uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, for example, they've saved millions of African kids lives. You know what I mean? So it's like, is that not good works? Sure. That's that's more good works than I might do in this life. You know what I mean? And so 
um, you have this kind of subjective element to like what constitutes as good works, like how many works is enough to prove that you're saved? You know, what what kinds of works? Who determines what kinds of works and those sort of things? So for the Protestant circles, I think we have a lot of that kind of messiness there. Like at least the Catholics are clear about it. You know what I mean? Where they say you have the venal sins and the mortal sins. That's clear. But um, I, my view personally, what I think is the most consistent in faithful scripture is that I think Christians, I believe we have free will, which is another thing that like some Calvinists um, might not agree with and um, at least libertarian free will. So I think in that aspect, I think that like Christians can live bad lives because we're saved by grace through faith alone. And so it's like we can be saved and be bad Christians. So you can be a bad disciple because Jesus says you're going to be a disciple. That's going to cost you something. You're going to have to deny yourself. Follow me. You know what I mean? And all these things like um, uh, pick up your cross and um, he's hyperbolic. But he says, hey, your mother and father and wife and kids um, in comparison to him, that's costly. But salvation, he paid the cost for. It's by his grace. And and so I really kind of me internalizing that deeper and deeper and thinking, man, it's really a free gift. The more I actually really internalized that and thought about it, that's when everything in my life seemed to change. And I don't know if it's um, like psychologically, you, you, you guys, you and your dad probably know better, but it's like when you know that you have this unconditional love and acceptance, and then you have somebody that's also pushing you, then you can change. You know what I mean? You can change from the inside then, but you can't change if you're trying to meet these quotas on the outside and focus on how good you are and that sort of thing. To me, that, that never worked for me. And I don't think it's like consistent with, with um, so much scripture either, but. Yeah, I mean, do, do you kind of know, like, I think in AA or something like that, they, I think they have some sort of acceptance kind of theory, too, which really helps people change, I think. But, I don't know how it yeah. works. I don't know. I don't know enough about AA. I know that it's helped a lot yeah, of people. Okay. I've had some other people on my yeah. podcast, and it's completely transformed their lives, too. Um, going yeah. back to what you were saying about works, mm -hmm. so I, I think we're in agreement from, like, the limited time I've spent reading and, and studying these things and talking to other people about it. I I'm in agreement. It's a weird it's a weird thing to say that you could be saved regardless of works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um but I think yeah. yeah, it is counterintuitive, but I think mm. it also it's like relaxing, it gives you a, a level of ease that maybe allows yeah. you to be good, right? Yes. Cuz you're you're yes. not doing it, you know, it's not good and resentful people experience this. It's not good to do things for somebody else because you think you have to. That's not yes, good. Even yes. if you end up doing yeah. doing like good things, if you're doing them to stop someone from being angry or because you feel guilty or because you think you have to, uh, you're just going to end up resentful. It's not going to be yes. good for anyone. You're going to end up overdoing it for people. You're not going to have the proper boundaries. I used to be like that because I used to feel, yeah. I think because I was sick too, I felt guilty all the time. So I was always trying to help more than I should help. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, being saved without it being tied to works allows you to kind of relax and then have the proper boundaries to allow you to do what you should be doing yes. rather than doing yeah. it out of out of guilt. So there might be, 100%, I don't know, well, there's yeah. probably something to that. So I agree anyway. Yeah. 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 And what's interesting is there's a passage in where Paul in Galatians 5, 16, where Paul says, keep in step with the spirit and then you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And what's so interesting about that is because he's talking about all these things with the flesh and he's not saying, don't do these things and then, you know, you're going to be okay. Like resist them, you know what I mean? In that sort of way in this passage, but he's saying uh, basically it's like when you keep your mind kind of focused on for like the gospel, you know what I mean? Like keep your mind and you know, keep in step with the spirit, then you're not going to gratify the desires of the flesh. And that's what I kind of noticed too, because that shame and guilt and all that stuff, once that stuff kind of just went away, that's when I actually had the desire. I mean, the willpower, the ability to be able to stop doing these things that were like controlling me for so long, you know? And so it's super counterintuitive just like the trinity is counterintuitive you know i think a lot of the fundamental christian stuff is counterintuitive which is why people naturally push back people that's why the gospel message is offensive which paul talks about in galatians 5 and 6 um because it's super offensive because that that's offensive to think that like somebody who lives an awful life like jeffrey dahmer could be in heaven because he believed in in christianity you know um, which i've done a video on but i think god's grace is oh. big enough to save any of us yeah 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 it's pretty weird but I don't know. Life is pretty weird. And I mean, we're told no. that we can't even, you know, I believe like can't even uh, understand what God is like, right? Can't, can't yeah. see it. You know, people are blinded, can't understand it. Yeah. So then who are we yeah. to, to understand the reasoning here? Yeah. And that was one of the things that helped me believe Christianity was true because I thought about it. I said, if you're going to make up a religion, 
why would you make up the Trinity for out of all things, right? You know what I mean? Like you're going to talk about the most counterintuitive thing that you can say to people. You're like, you know, you're like, why, why the Trinity, you know? Um, but I think the gospel message is similar because every other religion on the planet believes in a salvation based on works, every single other religion on the planet. And so when oh, that, I didn't you know, know that. that's why bugs me with Christians that, oh yeah, they all believe you have to do something and you have to keep doing these things in order to be saved. And Christianity says, no, it's a free gift. Jesus did everything so that way you could be saved. And so that's a radically different claim, which is super offensive, you know? And so I understand the offense, but yeah, but it's, you know, I think it's the only thing in some ways that really makes sense. It's the only thing that makes sense in my, in my mind, because um, if we could, if we have to do all these things, then it's like, man, who can say like when Jesus gets to the heart, like in Matthew five, or in the sermon of the Mount, he's like, if you looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Right. And you're like, dang, well, if you even looked at a woman, you're violating the laws. So like all of these rules, people try to come up with to say, um, you know, I know I'm saved because I don't do these things. And I'm like, well, in your heart, you probably do. And you're condemning yourself, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, that's why I think it's just such a, a beautiful and humbling and counterintuitive message. It's like, it's so bizarre all at the same time, you know? I love it. Okay, John, yeah. if people aren't familiar with you, where can they go to find you online? Yeah, just go to what do you mean? Um, it's spelled weird, W-H-A-D-D-O, and then Y-O-U-M-E-M-E. -M -E. Uh, what do you mean on all the social media platforms? And, and you'll find me. Okay. Thank you very much for coming on. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. This is so me. interesting. It's so strange. It's so interesting. Yeah, we'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Same. Sounds okay. good. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye.